everybody, welcome to my show. Thank you for having me on Global Times. We know from media reports that you are a victim of long COVID. Are you better now? I, I'm just 23, and I've been quite seriously ill with long COVID for 15 months now, and there's not really an end in sight. Um, the illness has had a pretty catastrophic impact on my life. So before I was ill, um, I just graduated from Stanford University and I was meant to start studying at Tsinghua University. Um, but I've had to spend almost 16 hours a day in bed almost every day um, for the last 15 months now. My main symptom has been this really intensely debilitating fatigue that, as I said, um, of m m forces me to spend uh, most of my um, life in bed. Um, and it prevents me from doing almost any of the things which I used to really enjoy. Um, so I can't walk for more than about 15 minutes, whereas before I bike 20 miles several times a week. I'm unable to write or read for any particular length of time. I struggle to see friends without feeling more exhausted afterwards. Um, and I also have various secondary symptoms, uh, which are characteristic of long COVID. So I've lost my sense of smell and taste. Um, I have mild tinnitus. Um, and I also have uh, mild gastrointestinal issues. The long COVID is defined as COVID symptoms at least one to three months after infection. And long COVID is a multi-system disease. Um, so it can affect many different bodily systems uh, from the respiratory system, car cardiovascular system, um, neurological system. And this is reflected in the set of symptoms. I think it's, it's quite difficult to capture how the fatigue feels to someone who hasn't experienced it. It's quite distinct from tiredness, which I felt when I was healthy. It's, you, you have this bone deep exhaustion throughout the day, which doesn't go away with rest. And kind of equally importantly, the fatigue gets worse with exertion. So if you overdo it, the fatigue can get significantly worse, such that you even struggle to walk, you struggle to stand up, even going to the toilet can be um, difficult when um, you've significantly overdone it. And so you end up almost being a prisoner in your own body. Before long COVID, did you get fully vaccinated? What vaccine is it? So I actually, uh, when, I, when I first felt ill, um, the vaccine hadn't been made available to my age group. Uh, I, I first followed it in March 2021. I got my first dose of a vaccine three months later, and I'm now triple vaccinated with the um, Pfizer vaccine. And the vaccine does actually reduce the risk of long COVID. I think it's estimated by 15 to 30 percent. But I, but it's important to emphasize that the vaccine is much less effective at preventing long COVID than it is at preventing death. So. Um, a va the vaccine only strategy, which we've had in Britain or America, has significantly reduced the death toll. But there's been a massive wave of long COVID, uh, s even in a very highly va vaccinated population. So at the moment, the, the, actually, the, the, the only the only thing you can really do with long COVID is rest as much as possible, because one of the real dangers with the illness is that if, if you try to push through the illness, you end up getting significantly worse. Omicron is highly contagious, but some believe it is not that dangerous and the symptoms are mild, so we can coexist with Omicron. What risks does Omicron pose? Is it mild? Um, the idea that COVID is just a flu, I think, is a um, almost purely political construct. We've decided that the pandemic is over. In Britain, we've been declared the pand pandemic is over. COVID is just mild. It's just the flu. Um, and I think the reality is far more complex than that. And I think that that understanding that COVID is mild is based solely on how a healthy young individual will experience Omicron. But I think the major misconception is that so much of our thinking about the risks of long COVID happens at that individual level, when um, actually I think the greatest um, dangers COVID poses lie at the societal level. And that's where, if you compare what COVID has done to SARS or MERS, um, SARS was terrifying at the individual level and killed, what, 10, 15% 10, of people infected, but it was contained within two or three countries, whereas COVID has unleashed far greater death and destruction worldwide and caused far greater um, uh, 
damage disruption because it's far more dangerous at the societal level. When you look at the societal level, COVID and Omicron look nothing like the flu. Because Omicron is so transmissible, I think at the height of the Omicron wave in the UK, we were talking about roughly 500,000 infections a day in a country of about 60 million people. So a huge number of infections. When you have that many infections, all those small individual risks multiply up to relatively high numbers. And so far, I think 400,000 people have, have developed long COVID from Omicron in the UK. So this purportedly mild variant that government that has led governments to declare that the pandemic is over has caused a really catastrophic wave of chronic illness for which we have no treatment or cure at the moment. Um, and then you also have to think about the societal impacts of um, long COVID. Well, well, at, at the height of the Omicron wave, um, the impact on the healthcare system, on um, employment was pretty devastating because when, I, I think at the height of the Omicron wave, 13% of the country had COVID <laughs> at, at one time, which meant that l many people were off work. Um, many people in key sectors like um, the health sector were off work. So you not only had lots of people more ill, but you had lots of doctors and nurses off sick. And so Omicron at the societal level causes a huge amount of disruption, devastation, which is nothing like the flu. If you didn't have long COVID, you would have become a sportsman scholar in Tsinghua University. What's the condition of your academic studies? When I felt ill, I was two terms into being a Schwarzman scholar at Tsinghua University. I had to do the terms online because obviously due to the pandemic, I wasn't able to get to China, which was such a shame because I was desperate to get to Tsinghua. I was so excited to live in Beijing. Um, and um, then I felt ill. <laughs> and if I'd been able to get to China, I probably wouldn't have fallen ill because China's contained COVID so well. So I, I, I wouldn't have caught COVID. Um, so uh, I've got one term left at Tsinghua, but I have to, I'm waiting until I improve to, to continue because at the moment I'm not nearly well enough to continue with my studies. How can China help the tens of millions globally with long COVID? I mean, this is one of the the, 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 the best side effects of China's um, containment strategy, that China doesn't have a major long COVID uh, problem. So I think that China has a really important role to play when it comes to long COVID research. And I think it's a role that can benefit China as well, because if there comes a point where China is unable to um, contain COVID, then China will have a major long COVID um, problem on its hands. And I think that China can... Um, help mitigate the risks of COVID spreading throughout the society through investigating, uh, through investing in um, long COVID research. Mm -hmm.